I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Tom Lynch Stoughton. Stoughton. I'm sorry if I. Uh, that uh, for doing today's webinar, <laughs> and he'll be speaking to us about the today about the uh, use of cattle and the conservation of grasslands. John, uh, Tom, whenever you're ready, uh, please go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much, Ian, and uh, thanks as well to to John for uh, getting these things going, and um, and of course roping me in to do this. Uh, uh, honored to present uh, for this webinar, and uh, hopefully through this, through this, um, through my series of slides here, um, uh, that that we can get some good discussion going for after. And uh, if there's anything that you'd like to ask during the presentation or comment on, feel free to cut me off or do so. Um, and just want to make sure, Ian, you can uh, hear me okay. Okay, good. I'm going to turn my camera off now, just just so that there's better uh, connectivity and uh, get going with it. So again, thanks for having me. So um, so uh, I wanted to start this presentation. This is a this is a picture of uh, our family ranch down in southwestern Alberta. Um, I grew up there, and so so. Being raised and uh, uh, being able to work and manage the ranch when I was older, um, I've really been fortunate to be able to have that experience and be able to do so. Um, a little bit of background of me. So I did live on the ranch and run it with my brother for about 13 years um, before I moved to Edmonton, where um, I started working with Livestock Gentech at the University of Alberta, which is a genetics and genomics program. And from there, I started working with um, the Canadian Cattlemen's Association and development of a public engagement program. And then now to Alberta Beef Producers, where I'm the government relations and policy manager. And just as a point of interest, I'm also sitting on uh, uh, the policy committee at Alberta NAWAMP, the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, which is um, very closely related to the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture. So um, again, pleased to be here. So um, our ranch is uh, was started um, back in 1885 by my great grandfather. And, uh, you know, back in those days, it was quite a bit different world than it is today. Uh, our ranch has grown to about just under 10,000 acres of primarily native grassland. Uh, rough fescue is really the predominant grass species that lives on our on our ranch. And and you know, I think over the years, and even in my great grandfather's day, um, we we've learned how important managing that grass and that land is for the the well-being and sustainability of our of our own family and our own business. Um, back in the early 1900s, um, there was a lot of people that tried to farm a lot of these lands and some of these some of these old places where where people used to farm up on hillsides can still be seen on our ranch. But my great grandfather realized very quickly that that perhaps farming was not, even though the soil was good, was perhaps not the best use of the land in the southwest foothills, simply because most of the soil started to blow away. And so, so that's really what solidified for him and, and has carried on through um, the next generations about um, really the best use of the land that we have, we believe, is using grazing livestock to manage that grass and hopefully improve it for, for the next generation. Um, uh, just a quote from one of our neighbors up, up Highway 22 from Clay Chataway says, uh, you know, if you take care of the land, the land will take, af take care of you. And I think that's something that um, stays with me and many people in our industry um, uh, as we carry on through through running cattle ranches. Now, a little bit of, uh, we'll just try and advance the slides here, okay. Um, 
just a little bit of background about the about the Canadian beef industry. Um, I just did this from a Western Canadian prairie perspective. So if there are other provinces uh, joining in who are not Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, I apologize, but I was trying to focus mainly on the Great Plains and the and the Canadian prairies um, since it is the prairie habitat joint venture. But uh, just some just some statistics here about about the Western Canadian cattle industry. So we in Western Canada on the prairie provinces have about seven and a half million beef cattle. Um, and of those, uh, um, almost half of those are the mother cows and heifers that really create the core base of our cattle herd. Um, and the prairie provinces are uh, the main um, area for raising beef cattle in Canada and make up uh, three quarters of our of our national cattle herd. Um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, between those two, um, make up a good chunk of that. In terms of land use, um, Canada, the beef industry, we use uh, approximately 52 million acres of land. Um, the, this data comes from a national beef sustainability assessment we did in 2016. Uh, 44 million acres of which is pasture. So the other remaining acres is usually cropland that we use to raise cattle feed. Um, or uh, it, it can be um, other lands that perhaps aren't pasture, forested areas, etc. Um, of that, the majority is still considered native pasture or natural land for grazing livestock, which which uh, shows that we still have a lot of uh, of this native pasture left. And why this is important is, and why grasslands are important, and it's probably no news to you as the audience, is, you know, there, there are many ecosystem services and benefits that intact native grassland have. Uh, I like this quote from, and these stats from Jansen, um, that, it's estimated that one hectare of unbroken Canadian grassland sequesters as much carbon as a hectare of above ground temperate forest. Um, that puts it a little bit in perspective. Some of these lands can store large amounts of carbon, up to 200 tons of carbon per hectare. Um, that's likely the best soils, and unfortunately those best soils probably have been farmed. Um, on average, about 100 tons of carbon per hectare. Uh, Edward Bork at the University of Alberta has done a lot of work in, in management effects of carbon stores in grassland and farmland. Um, essentially says that about after you plow a grassland or put it under cultivation, uh, you can lose 30 to 50 percent of the carbon when that glass, uh, grassland is converted. So that's, that's quite a significant amount of soil organic carbon that that gets lost um of the of the grassland that the beef industry uses and the pasture land um you know it, it's estimated through all these statistics that we have that we store approximately 1.5 billion tons of carbon which on this slide uh was valued with 15 dollar uh price of carbon and um, uh, so you can just double this now to a $30 price of carbon at about $160 billion worth of carbon that we store under Canadian pasture lands. As well, we also know how important these areas are to biodiversity and wildlife habitat. Um, another statistic that um, that and data that we were able to draw out of the National Beef Sustainability Assessment um, was um, understanding that although we only use about a third of the agricultural land in Canada, um, it does still provide a substantial amount of the wildlife habitat capacity, uh, which is a which is an index that was developed by um, Brian McConkey and team at uh, at the Government of Canada. Um, that we used in our study. As well, we also know the amount of biodiversity on many of these Canadian rangelands that 
that we use to raise cattle and other livestock, but also the abundant wildlife and other organisms that are out there and how important those are. Um, this is just a quick slide that I got from the Beef Cattle Research Council. It, it shows some of these other statistics. And um, one of the, one of the um, misperceptions that I think in our consumers and our urban friends is that a whole bunch of this land that's being used to raise cattle could be better used by raising crops. And, and that's not always the case because uh, there's many lands that are steep or either too rocky or hilly or dry. Um, soil conditions aren't right um, for raising, raising crops or it's too windy like in, in the southwest foothills where our ranch is located. Um, so, so, you know, the, the importance of cattle in a, um, as part of a holistic system for growing food um, and can complement growing crops, not necessarily in contrast to growing crops, um, is pretty important. The challenge is, is we're losing, we're losing grasslands and we still continue to lose grasslands today. So um, some more statistics, we have lost about 74% of our native rangelands in Canada. It's, it's alarming. 71% um, of wetlands have been lost on the Canadian prairies as well. And we also know that these areas um, hold about 70% of our, of this is an Alberta stat, but Alberta species at risk are also on grasslands. And when we start to convert these, we start to lose a lot of those species at risk, like the Canadian sage grouse. There's also interesting um, studies coming out that are trying to look at the unintended consequences of various um, policy actions or developments um, contributing to the loss of these grasslands. So this is a study that um, uh, Mike Alexander from Alberta Environment shared with me that came out of the, the U.S. And what they were looking at was there was a there was a big public push to um, restrict grazing on public lands. So uh, much like in the States, in Canada, uh, we do not only graze on private lands, but we also graze on, on crown land, public land forest reserves, um, or crown land under grazing leases. And um, these are very important to our industry um, and the main reason is, is because they provide a cost-effective access to grazing because private land is quite expensive to buy, whereas lease land, um, buying a lease is, is much more cost-effective. So what this group of researchers did, they looked at, well, what, what, uh, is there any consequence of restricting grazing on these public lands? And what they found was that if they were to restrict grazing on these public lands, um, it would result in a loss of, of private lands to conversion. And the reason is, is because the overall economic model of a rancher grazing both private and public um, works. But once you get rid of that access to uh, more or inexpensive grazing on public lands, it makes it less palatable to remain ranching on your private land when perhaps the better economic model is to farm it. Um, and so they modeled that if they restricted grazing lands, this is mostly in Montana, by 50%, it would result in an additional loss of about 180,000 hectares of sage grouse habitat on private lands. So that's quite an interesting unintended consequence of a policy action that you wouldn't think would affect um, private land conversion. I stole this from the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Um, it shows uh, just a little bit of the context of, of how much 
intact rangeland is left in Canada. And as, as you can see through the red, a lot of what we have is arable, flat, farmable land has already been farmed and, and there really isn't um, a lot of native rangeland left in Canada. In addition, the World Wildlife Fund, they put out a plow print report every year. Um, World Wildlife Fund US is very concerned about preservation of grasslands um, in the northwestern US. Um, and as you can see from this, from this uh, graph, the northern Great Plains that they're concerned about, where there is still a lot of intact grassland extends up into Canada. Um, whereas around the edges here, a lot of it has already been plowed. So um, one thing I, I have to say about World Wildlife Fund, which is interesting, and I think it's really a testament to, to perhaps our beef industry changing how we think about working with ENGOs like the World Wildlife Fund. And, and I think, you know, uh, it can really go back about 10 years where World Wildlife Fund started looking at um, what could they do to help um, keep these ranches or keep the northern Great Plains and these native grasslands intact. Um, and they worked with a rancher named Nancy Labe um, who, who said, well, if we work with these ranchers that are already stewarding the land, um, recognizing that that the vast majority of them are trying to preserve and, and even enhance the health of those rangelands, perhaps that's the best way to do it. And then Bob Lowe from, at the time, well, he's our president of Canadian Cattlemen's Association, had a good conversation with Nancy and then, um, and that's kind of where the, the collaboration started with a group like World Wildlife Fund. And yes, we have been working for many, many years with other ENGOs um, like Ducks Unlimited and Nature Conservancy, but this was a little bit of an attitude shift, um, I think, for the Canadian beef industry that we can really collaborate because we share some of these same values. Back to a little bit about, um, you know, why this is still a concern. Uh, Fred Hayes um, for the Nature Conservancy Fred Hayes was my predecessor at ADP in policy, uh, looked at some Statistics Canada data and, and tried to find out really what is the effect and if, if it is still a problem of land conversion. And yes, between 1991 and 2016, um, 3.6 million acres were converted to cropland still in the Canadian prairies. And if you do this over a year-to-year -year basis, it's, it's about 147,000 acres per year. Now, I don't know what the current stats are between 2016 to now. If we are still seeing some loss, I expect it's a little bit. Um, it may not be that drastic, but still, uh, to me, it presents quite a bit of concern. Now, why is this happening? Um, obviously, um, arable land that can be converted to a crop um, and, and to grow food um, is the main driver of conversion. Um, but, you know, there's other things that are contributing to this in the background. And um, I like to pull this one up. It's uh, the Canadian Centre for Food Integrity does a lot of consumer surveys uh, and tries to figure out what's going on in the public. And one of the things they found from a survey in 2016 is that 93% of Canadians say they know little or nothing about farming. And that's really because, you know, as we go through generations where maybe 30 years ago or 40 years ago, um, someone living in the city had a direct one generation connection to someone living on a farm, we're getting farther and farther removed from from where our food comes from and where it's produced. And what happens then is that, you know, people hear only small amounts of information, um, some of them coming from um, very famous directors. Um, and while a headline like this um, didn't necessarily need to say eat less meat because 
having James Cameron invest in Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan peas is a very good thing. I don't think it had to be in conflict with with eating less meat. Um, and, and when the rhetoric out there is to continue to eat less meat, uh, where we see some studies like this or headlines like this, that it'll reduce our carbon footprint more than cars, um, based on data that may not be fully telling the whole story, um, it, it starts to have this problem of continuing to push um, that conversion and perhaps conversion into farmland um, where, where the public and policymakers, et cetera, may not understand the full consequences of going down that road. The main driver, of course, um, this is just a cool picture that I had that I wanted to put in and you can, uh, this was a kill deer that was nesting on our driveway. Uh, back at the ranch, you can see her eggs, and this was shortly before she did her broken leg or broken wing um, decoy to get me away from her nest. But uh, anyway, I put this up here just as a symbol of nature and biodiversity, but really the main driver, and this is a quote from a farmer in Saskatchewan or in Manitoba that said, wheat pays better than biodiversity. And that's the simple economics of why people do continue to get out of ranching and start to go into crops that that whether it's true or not the perception is is it's less risky and more often than not you can have a more successful and sustainable economic business than you can with raising cattle or other livestock um, so you know we as an industry um we wanted to figure out, first of all, well, what is our environmental impact? I mean, we have all this people saying how bad cattle are for the environment. What is actually true and what's not? So, so um, about six or seven years ago, um, the industry started a little project called the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, which, you know, I'm very proud to be a part of. It's it's. I believe it's got almost 100 members, if not more, which is a variety of uh, its stakeholders from primary producers to retailers to other organizations that, that contribute to the beef industry to environmental organizations like Ducks Unlimited and Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund. Um, and as well as governments and academia. Um, and, and I think trying to figure out where we were in, in our environmental impacts allows us to start to think about ways that we can either change the misperception about the beef industry, recognize, hopefully communicate to people the importance of making a decision based on one environmental metric like greenhouse gas impact or emissions versus the overall holistic benefits that perhaps the beef industry can provide to society that hopefully um, helps reduce some of those greenhouse gas impacts or concern. So um, I believe the CRSB and the study that the life cycle analysis that we did has been hugely beneficial to the industry and, and is continuing to help us recognize our impacts and also show um, those benefits that cattle can provide, especially to the preservation of grasslands. As some examples, um, that stat you heard that, um, or that I showed you before of how reduce eating less meat giving up on meat would reduce your environmental impact by uh, way more than transportation, which is not true. And especially in Canada, um, we found that our beef industry accounts for only 2.4% of Canada's total GHG emissions. Um, compare that to transportation, which is 28% of Canada's total GHG emissions. And this is based on data, there's new data coming out about um, really quantifying um, those emissions that, that happen from 
various foods. And one of those, of course, coming from cattle is methane and, and understanding the difference, differences between incremental methane or CO2 versus a cycling system. And so as an example, uh, you can see this one, fossil fuels, we are taking carbon that has been stored for millions and billions of years and burning that and it's becoming incremental emissions to the atmosphere. Whereas when we're raising cattle, there is a cycle that's happening where, um, as you can see, it's quite complicated, but incremental emissions from cows theoretically now, and this is the new thinking about the global warming potential of methane, is that a lot of cattle production, even though we do still cows emit methane, um, a lot of that is cycled back into the soils and into the grass and continues a cycle. And theoretically, that's an equilibrium. If the amount of cattle or livestock on your landscape don't change. Um, so that, so, so perhaps our greenhouse gas emissions, as we learn more about these carbon cycles, um, could be quite a bit less than we originally thought. Um, in addition, you know, there's been a lot of, of research going into other areas such as um, understanding the impacts of, of raising something like beef versus other forms of food. This was a study done in the U.S., really interesting study that they said, okay, well, what if we substitute it, took out all of beef production and just substituted with a vegetarian diet? Um, what would be the land and greenhouse gas impacts? And they did find that, yes, um, and this is, again, based on, on traditional methods of accounting for greenhouse gas emissions from cattle, that, okay, yes, you would produce um, about 23% more food if you converted all that land into raising vegetables. Um, however, you would, um, you would have a significant... Um, deficiency in the U.S. population's requirements for essential nutrients. Um, so that says quite a bit. You would reduce your greenhouse gas emissions by about half. So um, U.S. Um, percentage of their total greenhouse gas emissions coming from cattle is about the same as Canada, at about 2.4 to 3 percent. So you could reduce that that to one and a half percent. So, so it's quite, quite interesting that you could have a new nutritional deficiency in the U.S. population, even though you're, you're producing 23% more food. Now, some of our stats as well. Um, one thing we also learned, uh, many arguments against cattle ranching is, well, we could use that, that land um, to, grow, to grow feed for human consumption, or... Um, or there's all this arable land, annual cropland that's going into feed for cattle that also could be used for, for humans. And that's really not true. The vast majority of feed that is given to livestock, even if it is a grain, is not edible by humans. Um, and this was a study done by Ann Modit. And, um, not only is the majority of what cattle eat is forage and grass, which we can't eat, um, the, the grains and biomass and crop residues um, that do go into cattle usually don't make it for human edible consumption. In addition, our, our study with the CRSB also found that of all the cropland, annual cropland in Canada, only about 9% is used to... Uh, to grow feed for cattle. And so, yes, while you might be able to, to convert that 9% into growing uh, canola or pulses or something else, um, uh, it's not the vast majority that, that many of our consumers think it might be. And luckily, I know perhaps some of you 
um, listening, um, have your own opinions about the UN and the Food and Agriculture Organization, but even the Food and Agriculture Organization in recent years has really recognized how important livestock plays in our food production system in terms of not just um, nutritional requirements and economics for many people around the globe, but also for the preservation and conservation of grasslands and biodiversity. So these, the, I, I do believe that the, the perception of, of, of beef production, especially in Canada, is changing. I think we still have a lot of work to do to help um, our public and policymakers understand the importance of preservation of this grassland. And I think we can do it. Um, so what do we need to do? Um, I put this list up here, um, you know, and I, there are so many things that we can do to help continue to preserve grasslands. And probably number one is it really comes through the economic driver that, that allows us to sustain our ranches. And that's paying for beef and continuing to demand eating beef, because that is what will keep us raising cattle, um, beef or other livestock on the landscape. And that requires a huge amount of public engagement. Um, the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef uh, created a certified sustainable um, uh, uh, beef product. So, so ranchers and and feedlots and, and processors can get certified so that the consumer now can pay a premium for those people that are um, committed and doing the right things for environmental stewardship is one of the uh, factors that, that um, you have to do to become verified. So that's a way that we can, we can continue to conserve grasslands. Um, we always talk about the ecological goods and services um, that grasslands provide. And I mentioned a few during the talk, um, but we are also going down the road of trying to recognize the value, the economic value that that stewardship provides to the rest of society. Yes, um, we absolutely do get a benefit in our own businesses of raising cattle on grasslands, but there are other benefits like wildlife habitat, um, nutrient recycling, water filtration, um, and biodiversity. So can we find ways to recognize that value and allow people to, to help us stay on the landscape? One of the things we're working on very hard right now is, is carbon credits for avoided conversion of grasslands. Um, conservation agreements are another tool that can help. Uh, financial instruments and lending, can we start to think about innovative ways to help young producers or the succession planning when loans can be tied to environmental stewardship or tied to um, the amount of carbon that you store in your land as, as some of that value. Um, habitat project support, of course. There are many uh, research and project-based um, government funding programs that help with this. Um, Cows and Fish is a good example that, that really helps to protect a lot of habitat that we can do. Policy development is, is, is also very important. Um, things like policies, government policy on the sale of public land, um, which is quite a contentious issue and, and, and it comes up for years, I mean, it was talked about at Alberta beef producers in the 80s, um, and it probably comes up about every decade, and we're having that conversation again now today. And and the what we have tend to fall back on is that the current model of grazing leases on public land seems to serve both our industry and um, the public very well in terms of conservation. And so... Um, that seems to be um, pretty important. Improved risk management programs. Um, this is something we're really working on very hard because um, raising cattle and livestock is risky. And we have pretty good risk management programs in 
crop insurance, um, for example, that are highly subscribed to, but we don't have as many risk management programs in in insuring for forage and pasture. And so that creates a, a, a competitive disadvantage for um, for the livestock industry and makes it riskier. Can we develop better programming? And yes, we have through things like cattle price insurance, which are hugely valuable to the industry to manage risk and hopefully keep us there. And lastly, I want to really talk about the importance of collaboration and partnerships. I think this is so important. Um, uh, and like I said through this talk, we've started working really closely with groups like Ducks Unlimited and the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund and ALICE and even even organizations like the Royal Ontario Museum. And we could talk about that later if there's time, but, um, but I, I want to put this quote out there, which I stole from Ducks Unlimited. And when the reason I say this is so important is because as the beef industry, we can talk about all the great things that we do to try to conserve grasslands. But the message coming from Ducks Unlimited, the same message, or from Nature Conservancy, or from the World Wildlife Fund, this same message, um, to be realistic and frank, will have a lot more impact than the same message coming from us. Um, hopefully, we get down to a point where public does believe what we as the beef industry have to say but this is why these collaborations are so important and and that we share the same values so i'm going to leave it there and um hopefully that's part sparked some some uh interest and thought and uh i'm i'm available to have a discussion Hey everyone, if you have any questions uh, for Tom, uh, please feel free to either type them in the uh, chat box or uh, go ahead and uh, ask him directly. Don't all, don't all ask at once. <laughs> Hi, Tom. This is John here. I'll just start it off. Sure. I, I did, I did uh, type a question, but just wanted to say in the messaging and collaboration uh, that you're having with the environmental groups, um, have you found sort of a division within the beef sector itself around the grass-fed beef producers or uh, the ranches of, the, say, southwestern Alberta? versus some of the livestock, op um, the feedlot operations? And has that been a difficult um, sort of integration between the, those two perspectives or is are they pretty aligned? So, um, okay, so I, I think you had a few questions in there. So are we, are we hearing um, disagreement between, um, just correct me if I'm wrong, disagreement or conflict of how we view view production of cattle um, with an, an alignment with ENGOs. Was that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think, you know, <laughs> we've got a beef industry of 50,000 producers across Canada with with 50,000 different opinions. So we are gonna have different opinions on how we, how we go about um, this goal of, of conservation of grasslands. And I think what, what is important to remember is um, as we work with ENGOs, it, it, it is a, um, it's not just automatically 
we trust one another. It's a build up over time and demonstrating through projects and through programming and developing new programs that work for both of us and, and creating that trust over time. And I think, I think the ENGOs we're working with this, in my opinion, are, are genuine and that we, we do have the same values, but, but there has been some mistrust for sure. And, and, and we have to um, figure out why that happened in the first place and what we can do to repair that, that trust. And, um, and I think, I think, I think we are going to get there. It's just going to take some time. Um, there's still, so, you know, I'm going to call out the WWF as an example. The World Wildlife Fund US is, is working really, really well with ranchers in the Northwest US um, and even us in Canada. Um, but World Wildlife Fund Canada um, doesn't really have it on its radar and is, um, has not been fully on board as much as the US component has. And that could be, there could be other priorities with World Wildlife Canada. Um, uh, which is fine, um, but but if we want to really try and work with World Wildlife Fund Canada, um, we have to start to communicate and talk a little bit more and figure that out. Um, in terms of our production system um, versus raising grass, fat, and beef over feedlot, um, grain, fat, and beef, um, we have to understand that uh, there is a demand for beef and um, I think both ways are going to be ways that we can provide that beef to the public. And as an example, there's a perception that grass, fat and beef um, is better for the environment and perhaps that might be true in some cases, but if we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, it's much more efficient to fatten animals in Canada on grain. And we know that, that it, it is less greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of beef produced. Um, I think there's absolutely an opportunity for, for all those types of systems where I see something like grass fat and beef becoming a premium seasonal product in Canada. Um, it doesn't make sense to me to raise try to raise grass fat and beef on hay be, simply because through the winter because it's it's not efficient and I think you start to negate any environmental benefits you had in the summer. Um, the feedlot industry has done an exceptional job at addressing concerns around animal welfare and health and ensuring their animals are comfortable and safe and um, I can't stress that enough, and and we do see the worst of the worst on media, but that is not a reflection of that industry. Um, many people, when I tell them that we raise cattle in Canada predominantly on grass for over 80% of their life, and it's only really the last three to four months that we put in a feedlot, um, they're quite surprised at that. And... Even on our ranch, we sell, we've sold um, sides of beef to, to friends and family in, in the city. And we'll have both grass, fat, and beef kind of available in August. And then we'll also do grain, fat, and beef in, in January, February. And we've had people that, that the, the grass-fed beef is too strong of taste for them because it does tend to be a bit more flavorful and a little bit more like game, um, where they've wanted to exchange that side for a grain fattened and then only buy grain fattened. So, so I think there's opportunity for both. And what we have to do is, is figure out um, the best ways that that whole system can work um, as a unit to continue to push our environmental impacts down wherever they may be. Hope that answered your question, John. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, if anybody else has any questions for uh, Tom, uh, please feel free to 
uh, get in touch with uh, John or uh, myself, or you can contact, uh, I assume you're okay with them contacting you directly, Tom? Oh, yeah, of course. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining uh, today's webinar. We, uh, we'd like to thank Tom again for his great presentation. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, at our next webinar. All right, uh, everybody, stay safe and uh, have a good day. Thanks very much, everyone.